Hi there and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. Back in 1981, when Chris Corby started Texas Gardener magazine, he filled a gap in garden publications. His guide to growing food and ornamentals in Texas tough conditions continues to attract new gardeners with every issue. Today he has a few tips for summer vegetable gardening and how to get ready for fall. On tour, let's meet the pioneers behind Angel Valley Organic Farm. These days, pet chickens entertain Joe and John Dwyer when they're not at work. And since they started Angel Valley Organic Farm, the only clock they watch is the ultimate timekeeper, the weather, to get their hand-grown organic food to eager customers on time for their Wednesday and Saturday markets. In 1995, they didn't live on a farm, but in a house in Jonestown, up the hill from a dream yet to happen. Then, in 1996, John decided it was time to take his business experience and their love of organic food beyond their backyard. And that's how we've always eaten, probably since college days. One of our, we were art majors and one of our art professors just drilled that into the students, which we appreciate. I mean, you know, at the young age of 18, we were hearing about this. Um, and as soon as you started gardening, it, it was, was always organic, organic. Yeah. always organic. Was... Started at the Austin Community Gardens. And so in 95, uh, I was thinking, what could we do? I'd already been an organic gardener for almost 20 years. What could I do? Uh, what could we do together? And uh, I thought, you know, maybe we could run an organic farm. So we started looking for property um, and uh, thought we'd have to go east towards Granger. Instead, they found the ideal spot just down the limestone and caliche hill, a secret valley rich with alluvial soil, a legacy of what is now just a bordering creek. And uh, to see dirt uh, a mile away from where we Out lived there. was just unbelievable. The 15 acres is their bird watcher's dream too. But to keep deer from their crops, including the apple orchard, John's first job was putting up fences. They built their new house and its rainwater collection system, bought a tractor, and in 98 planted their first cover crops. In 99 we sold our first uh, vegetable. But since a farm isn't a hobby, they applied their business experience to a new workflow. No longer could it be a backyard hit or miss adventure. This time, their seeds had to get to market on time. And now, organic gardening meant official certification and all its rules. It was definitely a growing thing. We didn't know the first thing about farming when we went into, into business. And, we we start, business. and it started smaller. We just had these these 400 foot rows and then the 200 foot rows back there that's like three acres, three acres. yeah so and now with. it's expanded to six it's like going from uh you know harvesting a, a basket full of multi-vegetables to baskets full of uh, single crops these days they share the load with four other passionate gardeners the days are still long, but as wise business managers, they knew they couldn't sustain 80-hour work weeks forever. Though now they harvest by the wheelbarrow load, their experience works for the home gardener. You want to keep land sustainable, and I think uh, it's difficult um, uh, to, to crop after crop after crop. And this is what I, I often see what happens in home gardens, is that um, what people do is they, 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 they plan a spring garden, they follow it up with a fall garden, they go back in with a spring garden, they go back with a fall garden. And, uh, you know, you just, I, I just don't think that you can continue, especially in the Texas uh, environment where you have such uh, extremes. Uh, extremes of the heat and, and breaking down organic matter and everything else. You just can't do it sustainably for a long period of time. You've got to give it a rest. So you got to get some diversity in there, get a little cover crop and some, you know, some uh, manure uh, um, compost in there and, and, and let it go for a season. We used to plant a direct seed a lot more than what we direct seed now. Yeah. We direct seed very little. Uh, green beans, carrots, turnips. Um, beets. Beets and radishes mm -hmm. is about it. Everything else gets uh, started in the greenhouse. So we do soil blocks. Uh, it's a kind of a European method where you mix your soil and you wet it up and you make these blocks that we put in plastic flats that we use over and over That's again. That's as opposed to using those cells, those trays with the little cells. We do this instead. Other plants, like squash, get started in larger pots before they go to the field. If we come out and try to direct seed, there's always patches and spots, and then you'll get a three-inch rain that washes seed out, and I mean, you just end up with problems or problems or problems. 
Once in the fields, row cover protects crops against cold spells from fall to late spring. What we're doing is we're pushing seasons. That's all we do is push seasons. We try to have the earliest and we have, try to have the latest of every variety that we possibly can. It also shields them from wind damage and especially insects. You share, there's definitely sharing, but it does help. We have all of our broccoli, all of our brassicas and mustards under cover right now because of harlequin bugs in the spring. It saves them a few sneak up in, underneath there, but if we didn't have them covered, they would just be mutilated. The squash, it, you can only leave it on until it's flowering, so then, of course, it can be pollinated. And it'll keep the cucumber beetles off for the most part while the cover is on. Of course, as soon as it's uncovered, they find it immediately, but at least you're protecting it for a while. So you get a head start, and at least you'll have the crop for a while, and in the meantime, you're planting another crop, and it's covered, and by the time they ruin that one, this one should be coming on if you time it perfectly, which we try to do, but don't always. Our lettuce never sees the full light of the day until we uncover it to pick it and then the row cover goes back on. We've got, we've got this row cover down to where we protect things. This is the master uh, of the Especially head, head lettuces and then and, and what you're doing is you're making sure that when you go to market with a head lettuce, it's beautiful, it's big. Uh, it hasn't been beat down by the wind. It hasn't be, been beat down by the rain. Uh, it's been under this row cover the entire Protected time. Protected from cucumber beetles and Correct. all the nasty stuff that makes them ugly. A home gardener wouldn't care so much, but we're taking them to market, so we want them to be stunning. Along with appearance, things have to taste good. Joe and John constantly experiment, because a good performer still gets the boot if it doesn't taste good. Aside from the tractor for tilling, like home gardeners, no machine does the work. It's all by hand, it's all intensive. It all takes much, much time. They also nurture beehives to keep those employees around when drought hinders the natural food supply. And when the sun sets, they're still at work, including online, updating what's coming up at this week's markets and Joe's stories about life on a farm. They're stories of resilience and optimism and the love of it all that keeps all gardeners sinking their hands into the earth. I think time has helped with that. I think I shed a lot more tears at the beginning of the farm than I do now. Because, I mean, I remember the first hailstorm we got hit by. It was our first year and it's, everything was looking great. We had made the mistake of walking around saying everything just looks great. And that night we got hit by hail. Nothing was covered because this was before we did all of this stuff. And it was just ruined. And of course I was just, I was devastated. We were both devastated. Yeah. Sunk into yeah. depression for a while. And then learned that they do come back and things do, are, are okay. And that you do keep going and you keep planning. So now when something like that happens, we think, well, okay. And you know, we'll just move on and what's next and we're fine. And you, you can't let it drive you crazy. It's out of your control, so you can't let it drive you crazy. Farming is a 12 month a year venture. And uh, so every month there's something going on. So if you get a setback like that, uh, things don't stop. Okie dokie, shopping time. Our thanks to the folks over at Angel Valley for opening their farm gates for us. It's so great to have fresh, produce growing right here in the Austin area. Well, speaking of produce, right now we're going to be talking with Chris Corby from Texas Gardener Magazine, and it's a real pleasure to have you on Central Texas Gardener. Welcome to the program. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, this is a, a magazine that you've been working on for 28 years. Now, you got to tell me the source of the inspiration for it. Now, what got this magazine started? Well, I've been a journalist, that's my profession, and also an avid gardener ever since I was six years old. Mm -hmm. I uh, got that interest from my grandfather, and I would notice when I'd go to get a book or a magazine to try to learn something about gardening or solve a problem, that the information was written for California or Connecticut, it just <laughs> wouldn't work here in Texas. Yeah. So uh, I put together some a team of writers, and we mm -hmm. wrote some articles and did, did some trial mailings, and uh, we were met with overwhelming success in, uh, back in 1981, mm -hmm. and we just haven't looked back since then. Well, that's great. We're so happy to hear that story. It's a similar story for Central Texas Gardener. People, local gardeners, just hungry for local gardening information. It's a lot of fun, too. And you, you, you were sharing some great stories about uh, uh, the inspiration of your grandfather. He was a farmer and an organic farmer, right? Right. My grandfather uh, 
gardened and farmed in San Antonio, mm -hmm. and he was an organic market gardener by by not by choice, just because that's the only thing he could do. He mm -hmm. had hogs and and cows, and that's where he got the fertilizer from for the garden. He mm -hmm. had to go someplace with it. He raised pecans. Mm -hmm. uh, he sold butter and milk on a little route on Friday afternoon. He uh, he put it in the old Chevrolet. Didn't have a pickup. <laughs> and he'd take, go into San Antonio and he'd deliver his his vegetables, whatever was in season, mm -hmm. tomatoes, uh, lettuce, cabbage, and milk and butter to his, his route every Friday. Well, you know, what goes around comes around, doesn't it? And it seems like we're seeing a rebirth of that kind of era where you have lots of small farmers and uh, beautiful gardens on the peripheries of the cities bringing the fresh pr produce back to town. What have been the big changes that you've seen in Texas gardening over that 28 years? Well, probably the biggest change has been the movement towards organic uh, gardening, which is a sustainable way of gardening and producing food and, mm -hmm. and ornamental crops. Uh, also, uh, a movement towards native plants. People mm -hmm. have finally realized that native plants are easy to grow. Something that's adapted to your area Absolutely. is a smart thing to grow. It doesn't, you don't have to worry about pests. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you could, if the soil is adapted, then you, can, you don't have to use as many amendments. And uh, the other thing that's changed as far as gardening over the last 28 years has been uh, people are concerned about water. Yeah. Uh, saving water and using water efficiently mm -hmm. and keeping it clean. You know, there's an old Peter, Paul, and Mary song that says, don't muddy the water, you may have to drink it someday. Well, <laughs> today we have to drink that water, so we need right. to keep it clean. And for our, not just for us, but for our future generations, our kids and grandkids. Well, I, I amen to all of that, right? I mean, it's it's really been an amazing change in the past 28 years, the way that gardening, I remember when I first did my radio show, all the questions were about growing azaleas and San Augustine lawn, so things, times have changed. That's for sure, <laughs> that's for sure. Tom. And uh, this is the time of year, speaking of changes during the course of the year, and I know that you have a real big focus in the magazine on vegetable gardening. Let's talk about, let's give some specific tips to people out there right now who are hungry to either keep their vegetable garden going from the spring into the fall, or maybe getting a running start on planting some things for the fall. What's the, what are, for those people who, who are, are holding on to their tomatoes or battling off the spider mites, and uh, do you think, it, what's the best thing to do right now for that spring garden? Well, for that spring garden, go in there and evaluate it if you've got uh, severe spider mite uh, or early blight infestation in your tomatoes or, or disease problems or insect problems in your other crops, then pull them out and be ready to replant for mm -hmm. fall. Uh, if it's not bad, you can get tomatoes. Uh, peppers often do better in the fall. Yeah. And peppers that are carried over from spring. But what you need to do is go in there and, and don't be ashamed that you got a few weeds because we all have weeds <laughs> this time. <laughs> Amen. Unless yeah. that's all, all you do is manage your garden. Right. Uh, go in there, weed eat the garden, mm -hmm. put down a good layer of light colored reflective mulch. Mm -hmm. And the reason we want light colored reflective mulch is to reflect the heat. Right. And if we were gardening in the winter, we'd want a dark mulch that would absorb the heat mm -hmm. and warm the soil. But since in Texas, you know, we get 100, 105 or more. Yeah. And we need something to, to kind of keep that soil temperature moderate or mm -hmm. cooler. What do you recommend in terms of light colored mulches? What are your favorites? Anything organic mm -hmm. that's that, where we're recycling. And we, we use ground up tree yeah. uh, bark and stuff like that that mm -hmm. doesn't cost anything. Right. Now the problem is when you, later on when you incorporate that into the soil, it's gonna tie up some nitrogen. Right. So you need to add a green cover crop or some form of nitrogen mm -hmm. to replace the nitrogen that's tied up in the decomposition of the, yeah. the wood chips. Wood, but yeah. If you can find hay yeah. that has not permitted grass hay that's been treated with Grazon P plus D, which has picloram in it, then that's a good choice. Mm -hmm. uh, wheat straw, oat straw, those are, alfalfa is a really good, okay. it's not light colored, but uh, back to wheat straw or oat straw, those usually don't have the herbicides that would hurt a mm -hmm. garden and can be used as mulch if you can find them. Well, you just said a, sh a short while ago that it's getting ready, it's, we should be getting thinking about for sure the fall garden. And actually that com the planting comes up real quick now in terms of getting things in the ground. What do you like to plant now thinking forward into the fall? Okay, well, well, one of the things that's a little bit more of a summer garden than a fall garden is pumpkins. I like to plant pumpkins right now in the middle of June because the kids love them. My grandkids just get the biggest kick out of growing pumpkins. Sure. And uh, we plant them middle of June to the first part of July. 
they take up a lot of space but then what else is growing in your garden that exactly time right right and uh, they have very few pests the only thing they need is space and water mm -hmm. and so that's one thing uh, then there are a few other crops like southern peas, okra, malabar, spinach that could be, still be planted in the garden mm -hmm. at this time of year. Right. Uh, then we need to start thinking about getting the soil put ready for fall plants and tomatoes and peppers need to go in in July. Yeah. We can't wait any later than that because we won't have enough to mature the crop in mm -hmm. before freezing weather in, in the fall. Right. What are the big pests when you when you when you Answer. I know you probably get thousands of letters and emails every year. And people, what are the biggest pests that you consider to be pests? Well, the biggest pest is heat, <laughs> and along with heat comes uh, spider mites, uh, mm -hmm. squash bugs, uh, stink bugs. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, these the dirty are dozen. <laughs> yeah, the dirty dozen. And 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 I'm of the mind that uh, I, I try to do things that are that are mechanical or organic that don't involve any kind of Mm. A toxic spray because sure. I don't care if it's an organic toxic spray or yeah. a, a non-organic it's still something that could hurt you and I don't yeah, want right. to put it in my mouth yeah so we remove egg casings we look for egg casings on insects and remove them mm -hmm. destroy them uh, spider mites uh, there's only one thing that'll kill them and it's very toxic so we'll go with a spray of water or mm -hmm. Uh, compost tea or something, try yeah. to keep them off the plants. Yeah. But I, th I think that works as well as anything else on so many of the pests, just jetting them off with water. It's a right. simple thing. And we know water's not toxic. But, yeah, uh, not yet. We, we have just a, a, a short bit of time left here, and I, wanna, I just want to make sure that we steer people to the magazine. And uh, the best way to get information about Texas Gardener Magazine is actually on the web right now, isn't it? That's correct. The yeah. website is the very best place to find out more about Texas Gardener Magazine. And uh, people can be in touch with you there, and I'm sure they can find a lot of content on the, on the web as well. We have a lot of content up on the web from past issues. Yeah, that's that's great. So uh, for people who are interested, they can they can find out all. You know, we were I hate to interrupt any good conversation, nice. and I've been enjoying it tremendously. But uh, for people who want to learn more about dealing with the pest or the fall garden or any of these things, this is again a great resource. This is Texas gardening information for Texas gardeners, and the website is Texas. What's real quickly? It's uh, www.texasgardener.com. Perfect. All right, Chris. Thank you so much for being a part of our program, and good luck to you. And coming up next, it's Skip Richter. Hello, and welcome to Down to Earth. This week's question involves lawn weeds and summertime. How do you control weeds in your lawn when the weather heats up? Well, first of all, we want to remind you that those broadleaf weed killers that are used against not the grassy type weeds, but the broadleaf weeds are very damaging to St. Augustine and some other grasses in the summer. Plus, if you over apply them, they can damage your other plants nearby as well if they drift over onto them or wash onto them. You see, they kill broadleaf plants and they don't care if it's a weed or perhaps some pansies or petunias nearby, they're gonna work on it equally well. So you wanna be careful. In fact, you wanna totally avoid those when the weather heats up over 85, which it is definitely done by now. Broadleaf weeds are best managed by hand pulling or regular mowing in the summer. If you can tolerate them and ignore them for now, that's probably the best thing to do. As you build your lawn and, and get a denser lawn over time, it's going to choke out 90% of those broadleaf weeds and grassy weeds too in most cases. So you just want to continue to mow, water, and fertilize properly to build a good, strong, healthy lawn or do a little hand pulling here and there if the problem is more sporadic. If you do need to use any weed control products, you want to wait until the weather cools off to do that. And it's really too late to do the pre-emergent types of herbicides now as well. All of our warm season plants, or warm season weeds rather, have sprouted, and so there's no sense in applying those. So although the labels may claim they'll control all your lawn weeds, it's just not a good time at this point. Our featured plant is Salvia Mystic Spires. This is my favorite indigo spires type salvia. Many of you have grown indigo spires in your gardens in the past. It's a great plant, but it flops all over the place. It gets really large and it sort of takes over. In many of our modern homes, we don't have that much landscape to spare and we don't need a plant that gets that large. Mystic Spire stays about three feet wide, maybe two feet high. 
It looks just like indigo spires, beautiful blue spikes. It just blooms and blooms on through summer. If you want, you can cut it back, uh, but you don't need to. It has a, a better structure, too, to the plant. It tends to hold its branches up and form more of a mounding plant that, that really uh, resists flopping over. So look for mystic spires in landscapes. It's a perennial. Once you purchase it, it comes back year after year. And it's one of those rare plants that blooms blue all through the hot weather. In the garden, it's time to feed those flowers and vegetables. If you want them to continue to produce, you need to provide a little extra nutrition. By continuing to fertilize in small amounts, the tomato plants will retain the vigor, and as they have some disease damage to the leaves, they'll grow healthy new leaves and continue to produce for you. That's true for our flowers as well. In the hot weather, we want to plant melons and winter squash and okra and a lot of those other warm season plants. No reason to give up gardening just because the weather has gotten so hot. And replenish the mulch in all your beds to keep the weeds down and also to keep the soil temperature cool and hold in a little bit of that extra moisture we want to save all the moisture we can get because as the weather heats up, it's harder uh, to keep plants adequately hydrated. For more plant tips or to contact the Extension Office in your county, visit klru.org ctg. Thanks, Skip. Now let's check in with Trisha Shirey for Backyard Basics. We all have places that are just kind of tough to get anything to grow. And I've got some suggestions today for tough plants for those tough places. Now, all the plants that I'm discussing today just have very few insect problems. You just won't have to worry about spraying and, and watching out for insects with them. One of the toughest is the cast iron plant. And this plant is aptly named. Now, it does like shade. It will tend to bleach out a bit if it's in too much sun, but it's really good for those dry, shady spots doesn't really care for too much water. And if the uh, uh, leaves start to look a little battered or a little brownish, just cut them to the ground, new ones will come. This one also can be an indoor plant as well, but it's one that you just don't want to water very often at all. And uh, if you've got a dark, shady spot where nothing else will grow, the cast iron certainly will. And it's evergreen for us, although I do cut it back quite hard in the, in the spring and get some new growth. Now, another one that is just tough as nails is the flame acanthus or anisacanthus. It really is very drought tolerant, doesn't need a rich soil at all. Deer don't tend to like it and hummingbirds love it. You'll get orange flowers almost all year long. It can be a bit invasive, but just cut this, the plant back several times uh, in the year to control the seeding of the plant and you won't have it coming up all over. But it's really a great plant. Another one that I really love, it's a fairly new introduction from South Africa, is the bulbine. And it comes in this yellow form. There's also an orange form, and they're both really lovely and uh, bloom just about all year long. Now, occasionally they'll start to get a little crowded and you might have to cut them back and, and uh, replant them and thin them out a, a bit, but they really are tough as nails. Wet or dry, sun or shade, it just doesn't really matter. Another great one is the society garlic. There is a variegated form, also the green form. The flowers are edible. Does smell a bit like garlic, but if you've got an area next to the sidewalk or a pot that's in a sunny area or even a shady area, this society garlic will grow in very narrow spots um, against rock walls. It's just really great. Another ground cover plant that's a Texas native and very tough is the frog fruit. And this is a verbena family member that just trails all over the ground. You can walk on it, you can mow it. It will grow in sun or shade, wet or dry. I've seen this growing in asphalt and concrete si cracks in the concrete sidewalk. So it's really a tough plant and it grows easily from cuttings as well. The Zexminia is one of my favorites. For alongside a driveway, that little bit narrow strip bed at the street, or in containers where you're in the hot, hot sun, Zexminia will bloom for you all summer long and has a great flower that is attractive to butterflies and is just really a terrific plant. It will seed itself and come up too, and it's easy to, to uh, collect the seeds and start it from seed. Another one that I love is the foxtail fern. It will grow in sun or shade and wet or dry. It does sometimes tend to have some freeze damage in uh, harder winters, but if you just cut those freeze damage plumes back and uh, 
let it grow again, it's great. I like it in container plants. I often plant purple oxalis underneath it or uh, sweet potato vines with it. And it's just a stunning container for those tough shady spots where you can't get anything else to grow. So these are some of the tough plants that you can grow in tough places in your yard. And there are many more, so I hope you'll continue to experiment to find the right plant for the right spot in your garden. For more tips, online video, and our weekly blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Until next week, I'll see you in the garden. Visit klru.org slash ctg to learn more about today's program, upcoming events, and to sign up for our electronic newsletter. Check out John's how-to tips and visit Trisha's Corner for ideas inside and out. Get growing at klru.org slash ctg.